Hey guys, so today we're going to be taking a look at World War I. Um, so we're going to be covering several different worksheets here. Uh, so the first is the causes of World War I worksheet. Um, so you can see like it's got long-term causes, immediate cause, um, then down at the bottom, should U.S. enter the war. Then we are going to be looking at this one, which at the top says fighting over there. And then at the bottom it says over here. So this is looking at the war itself and the home front in the U.S. And then finally, we will go to the end of the war, um, which has different boxes, top cost of the war, then Paris Peace Conference 1919, um, going on from there. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Uh, so as we get started with World War I, a couple things that I think are important to remember. First of all, when the war began, it was right at the beginning of Woodrow Wilson's administration, um, the first time he's elected. And the United States is trying to practice neutrality. They want to stay out of it. Uh, a lot of people think that this is Europe's war. The United States has no business being involved in it. And that's going to be kind of how Wilson maintains his first um, term in office. In fact, when Wilson ran for re-election in 1916, he ran on an anti-war platform. Um, he opposed the war. He actually ran as a peace candidate. There's a, you see the pin at the bottom corner of the screen there where it says, War in Europe, Peace in America, God bless Wilson. So this is like the idea that he kept us out of the war, right? So that's why you should re-elect Wilson. Um, but as we are going to see, that does not hold for very long. Um, so let's jump into the causes of the war. And in a lot of ways, this is kind of world history review. So you should um, have a good idea of this already. So we're going to go through it kind of quickly. Um, so the first thing that you will notice is the long-term causes spell out the word main. M-A-I-N militarism, alliances, imperialism, nationalism. So you can also call these the main causes of the war. And if you can remember what those letters stand for, then you'll be able to remember what they are. So the first is militarism. Basically, there's a massive arms race in Europe where all of the military powers are starting to build up their militaries. The one that most of the countries are doing is their naval forces. So particularly, Germany starts to build up their navy. If you look like where Germany is on the map, right? It's pretty close to England. England's got a pretty powerful navy already. So England kind of sees this as a way that Germany is threatening Great Britain because they're pretty close together. Um, whereas Germany sees it as kind of a way that if they need to, they can match Great Britain in their navy. Um, so the arms race is the first uh, thing that people are doing here. The second is alliances. So there are two major alliances in Europe at this time. The first is the Triple Entente, and there are a lot of people in these alliances, but these are the big ones. So we've got France, Britain, and Russia. So uh, these are going to be the Triple Entente here. The Triple Alliance is Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. And Italy will actually end up changing sides in April of 1915. So after the war starts, they join Britain and France and Russia. Um, but before the war, they are allied with Germany. Okay, so that's important to keep in mind as we're looking at these. Um, so you may wonder why alliances might be a cause of a war. That's going to play a role into one of the immediate causes. So keep that in your mind when we um, come back to that. The second one that we have here is imperialism. Um, so look at this political cartoon in the upper right-hand corner uh, of the page. You see that there's a bulldog, and Britain is often represented as a bulldog uh, in political cartoons and stuff. So we've got Britain in the dead center of the Union Jack flag, which is the British flag. It says, are we afraid? No. And why not? Because look what surrounds Britain. Um, we've got Australia, New Zealand, Canada, India, South Africa. So these are all of Britain's major colonies. So they're basically saying we can defend ourselves on any continent in the world, right? We've got North America, we've got South America, um, or not really South America, but we've got North America, we've got Asia, we've got Africa, we've got um, like Indonesia. We are good, right? So the idea here is that imperialism is causing people to compete over these worldwide colonies. So think about like what we saw with the Spanish-American War, that Spain and the United States were competing over who got to control Cuba. This kind of stuff is going on in Africa. Nations are competing over African colonies in um, Southern Asia, like India and Indonesia and that part of the world. So all of these major European powers are basically fighting each other over who gets to control what colony. When the war breaks out, that's what makes this a world war. 
because they're going to keep fighting in the colonies as well as in um, Europe. Okay. The last one we have is nationalism. So national, nationalism was a movement that began in the late 1800s. And basically there's this sense of national pride. And a nation in this sense is not necessarily your political boundaries. Um, the way that I like to think of it is, you know, I am a United States citizen, right? So that's my nation. That's my political boundary. But culturally I'm Southern, right? So that you could almost consider to be my nation, um, which is Southern culture, Southern um, you know, language, so to speak, Southern heritage. That's what's kind of going on in Europe, except on a grander scale. So in the Austrian Empire, you might have people who are Serbian who live in Austria, and that's their political nation, but they consider themselves Serbian. And that's what they consider their nation. Um, you can see this over here. This is uh, playing at Irish nationalism, right? So this idea that one Irishman can defeat ten Germans, right? So join an Irish regiment today. Join an Irish national regiment. Um, and a lot of these ethnic groups are wanting their own political boundaries. So groups like the Polish people, Slavic, Serbs, um, those are ones that are big in Austria, Hungary, Bosnia, and all of these different places. Um, so this is kind of all the stuff that's simmering in the background, right? This stuff has been going on for a long time, since the mid-1800s, and it's always there, and it's causing tension, and it's causing conflict, but you need something to make it all boil over and sp a spark that gets all of these things blown up, right? So that spark um, is the immediate cause, and that is the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. So Franz Ferdinand was the Archduke of Austria, and he was the next in line to be the new leader of the Austrian-Hungary Empire, okay? So you see um, basically what the idea is. Austria owned a lot of nations in Europe. They had a lot of territory. And a lot of these nations didn't want to be a part of Austria. So there's one particular group, the Serbians, who form a nationalist group known as the Black Hand. And the Black Hand is really unhappy with Archduke Franz Ferdinand. So one of the Serbian nationalists plans an assassination attempt. Franz Ferdinand and his wife are in an open car, like a parade. And they actually had attempted to shoot him once already and missed. Uh, but then they do manage to gun him down, and he and his wife are both killed. You can see the photograph from their funeral down there at the bottom. Um, and so Austria freaks out. Their crown prince has been murdered, right? So Austria starts to blame Serbia. And they're like, dude, you owe us recompension for this. Well, Russia decides they want to back Serbia up. So Russia tells Austria that if they declare war on Serbia, then Serbia is going to back up, or Russia is going to back up Serbia, right? So Russia ends up declaring war on Austria-Hungary. Well, Austria-Hungary is allied with Germany. And so when Germany finds out that Russia has declared war on Austria, they declare war on Russia. Well, Russia's allies, France and Great Britain, are like, this can't happen. So then they declare war on Germany. And you can see how this is kind of a ripple effect, right? These alliances, because they were so entangled, what should have been a local issue between Austria and Serbia blows up into this major worldwide conflict between all of Europe and really the whole world. Um, so war officially begins in July of 1914. Uh, so that's kind of where we begin this. So as the war breaks out in Europe, immediately there are... Um, people who start questioning whether or not the United States should join in on this conflict. So that's where we're going to spend the rest of our time. Um, so this um, is an analogy here to just kind of help you remember this. So a lot of times you'll hear Europe called a powder keg. So a powder keg is a barrel, like you see here, that's full of gunpowder, right? So we're going to pretend inside the powder keg of Europe are our main causes, right? Militarism, alliances, imperialism, nationalism. And they just need one spark to make them explode, right? And what is that one spark? Well, it's this. So that's going to lead to Europe starting to simmer and grow, right? Until, eventually, this is what's going to happen. All of Europe explodes, right? 
so that's where we that's where we start with World War One. Um, this was an interesting political cartoon. It says the title of it is "The Crime of the Ages: Who Did It?" So, what is the crime? Look at the back of the political cartoon. There, there's a woman who's been stabbed, right? And who is this woman? She is the Peace of Europe. So, the Peace of Europe has been murdered. Who did it? Well, everybody is pointing fingers at somebody else. Serbia is pointing fingers at Austria, who's pointing fingers at Serbia. Germany's pointing at Russia, who's pointing at Austria. Belgium and England and France are pointing at Germany. Italy's kind of like over here twiddling its thumbs, like, I'm just going to stay out of this for a while. Remember, Italy is allies with Germany and Austria, but you'll notice they weren't part of that ripple effect. They actually kind of waited out. They're going to wait until this war kind of gets going before they decide what they're going to do. And as we know, who do they end up allying with? England and France, right? Um, so Italy's kind of a turncoat, and Britain and France never completely trust Italy, and that's going to play an important role later, so remember that. Um, so the United States is now questioning whether or not they should enter the war. So there's two sides. There are the side that's supporting the entry and the side who supports neutrality, who says we need to keep maintaining our neutral state here. Um, so here are some of the events that... Uh, gave way to the side that supported entry. So the first thing is Germany had commenced something called unrestricted submarine warfare. Germany had invented a submarine called the U-boat, which was a really phenomenal invention here at the time. It's one of the only submarines that any side has. That was part of their militarism. And they make a pledge with the United States very early on in the war called the Sussex Pledge. And basically what they say is like, look, we're going to be attacking ships. But since you're neutral, we promise that we're not going to attack any United States ships, right? Like, as long as U.S. merchant ships are out there, we're going to leave them alone. Well, unfortunately, they start to violate that, and they start attacking U.S. merchant ships. But it gets even worse when they start attacking passenger vessels. And one of the passenger vessels that they attack is the Lusitania. So the Lusitania was like a cruise ship, essentially. Um, and it was leaving from Ireland, and there were 128 Americans on board. The ship is bombed, um, it's torpedoed by German U-boats, it sinks in less than 15 minutes, and all 128 Americans on board the Lusitania are killed. Um, there is an outcry in the United States. Uh, the Germans said that they thought that the ship had weapons on it, and that's why they were trying to sink it. It was also a British ship. That was their enemy. Um, however, this is, like I said, like a cruise ship, right? So Americans freak out because of this. And this is going to start kind of encouraging a lot of those people. Um, the next thing that happens is that there are a lot of economic ties that we have with Britain and France. Um, so basically, we've loaned them money. We trade with them. They are kind of our closest allies in the world anyway. So a lot of people feel like because we have these economic ties with them, that we should support them in the war. At the very least, we should be like giving them supplies and money and that sort of thing. Um, the last thing that happens, and this is kind of the one that sets everything off, uh, is the Zimmerman note. So the Zimmerman note was a telegraph um, that was sent from the German Secretary of State, whose name was Zimmerman, to the uh, ambassador of Mexico in Germany, or from Germany to Mexico, right? So this is a German guy that is the ambassador in Mexico. So what this note did, um, what this telegraph said is, you need to propose to the president of Mexico an alliance where if we can't keep the U.S. out of this war, Germany wanted to keep the U.S. neutral, but if we can't keep the United States neutral, we want you to ally with us so that there is an enemy at the gates for America. And what we want you to do is attack them, and at the end of the war, we'll give you back all of the territory you've ever lost. Well, this telegram is intercepted that never makes it to Mexico. And when this is published in American newspapers, there is outcry because they've just basically said, we want to keep the U.S. out of the war, but just in case, here's, you know, an alliance that we can come up with. Um, so the fact of supporting neutrality, there are a couple things here. The first is isolationism. So basically what this is idea is that your United States wants to isolate itself. This is a European conflict. We need to stay out of it, mind our own business. We were not involved in this. We don't care about their colonies. We don't care about their empires. This is not an American thing. We have no business being involved in it. People started to argue that with the sinking of the Lusitania and the Zimmerman note that it has become an American thing, right? And that's eventually going to be the reason that Wilson does declare war. Um, the other thing is an economic thing. So this is similar to the economic ties, 
where basically there was this accusation that we were only going to war to protect our investors. Um, and that just wasn't a good enough reason for a lot of people. Basically, if it, all we're doing is going to war to help Britain out because we want to trade with them, that's not a good enough reason to kill American men, right? So that's the argument there, the two arguments against neutrality. As you can see, there are more arguments that support the entry for a lot of people. Um, so this is just an excerpt from the Zimmerman note. I just highlighted some of the important parts here. So at the beginning, he says, we intend to begin submarine warfare under, unrestricted. So whoever we run into, we're going to bomb them, right? However, it is still our intention to keep the U.S. neutral. Even though we're going to torpedo American ships, we still want to keep them out of this, right? However, if our attempt is not successful, we propose an alliance on the following basis with Mexico, that we shall make war together and together make peace. We shall give general financial support to Mexico. It is understood that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory of New Mexico, Texas, and Arizona. You are instructed to inform the president of Mexico of the above in the greatest confidence as soon as it is certain that there will be an outbreak of war with the U.S. Okay, so as soon as we figure out the U.S. is going to declare war, you need to go to the president of Mexico, and he needs to be able to sign up on this, and then he needs to go to Japan and form another alliance with Japan so that they can attack Hawaii and the West Coast. Well, you can imagine when this gets out, this is the straw that breaks the camel's back, right? <coughs> That's a terrible thing. So... Essentially, what we're going to do now um, is we are going to officially declare war based on this note. A um, couple other quick little images here. So this is just a newspaper article in the New York Times about the sinking of the Lusitania, um, you know, basically saying there's a lot of people dead. 1,260 refers to the total number of people on board. There were just 128 Americans. Um, but you can see that this is something that a lot of people are saying. This is going to be a big issue, a grave crisis is at hand. Um, this one is a political cartoon titled Germany Under All. So this refers to Germany's submarine warfare. Um, if you look at this political cartoon, Germany looks very menacing, right? It's a hand um, underneath the ocean that you can't see, and they're coming up to grab these vessels. It's hard to tell, but these are like teeny tiny little ships, right, that are being grabbed by Germany or torpedoed by Germany. This one, um, this is says John Bull uses the American flag for protection. John Bull is like the British version of Uncle Sam. And so if you look, there is a British submarine um, and a British vessel, the Lusitania, right? But what kind of flag is he flying? He's flying an American flag. So the idea is that he was using an American flag in the hopes that there would be some protection. So he's basically like um, taking advantage of it. And if you read the cartoon, um, the German sailor says, Who is it, what boat? And the British guy says, can't you see I'm a blooming Yankee? Right? Again, taking advantage of this when he's obviously not a blooming Yankee, right? He's an American. He's a British guy. Um, and then finally, this one, the crowning achievement, this latest submarine victim may be the last. And what is the latest submarine victim? U.S. patience, right? So basically, the United States is done. They've run out of patience. They're declaring war on Germany. Um, so Woodrow Wilson declares war on April 2nd, 1917. Make sure you write that on your paper here. Um, and let me just read you this excerpt from his war declaration speech. Uh, and it'll give you a good idea of Wilson's motivations. It is a war against all nations. American ships have been sunk, American lives taken, in ways in which it has stirred us very deeply to learn of. But the ships and people of other neutral and friendly nations have been sunk and overwhelmed in the waters in the same way. There has been no discrimination. The challenge is to all mankind. Each nation must decide for itself how it will meet it. The choice we make for ourselves must be made with moderation of counsel and temperateness of judgment, befitting our character and our motives as a nation. We must put excited feeling away. Our motive will not be revenge or the victorious assertion of the physical might of the nation, but only the vindication of right, of human right, of which we are, we, are, we are only a single champion. So why is Woodrow Wilson declaring war? What is he saying his motivation is? Does it have anything to do with the American vessels, the lives that have been sunk, or have been taken, the ships that have been sunk? No. 
it's a human rights issue where basically he's saying that the Germans are taking advantage of human rights all over the world and we are the champion of human rights. So this goes into his philosophy of moral diplomacy, right? Where we want to take care of the human rights issues in the world. So that is why a year after he runs as the peace candidate, he declares war um, on April, 9th, April 2nd, 1917.